So we're picking up in Colossians 3, verse 18 this evening. And as we start, I want to come back to a question, Phil, that you asked at the end of, of last time, which was, um, we're told in chapter 3, um, verse 2, set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. And he said, you know, some people might look at that and think, well, you know, you're just floating around and you're not really doing anything. You're not getting a job. You're not working hard because, you know, you just, your head's in the clouds. And um, some of you have seen the Bible Project. They make videos that, you know, summarize Bible books with nice animations. And uh, it mentioned it in there. And their application of that was um, above which is where we're to set our minds, is where Christ currently resides, who will return to make all things right. And Paul, in saying this, challenges his listeners to live in the present as the kind of new people that they will be when, when Jesus returns. Yeah. And then that's applied then through chapter 3 and chapter 4. And that new way of life impacts everything, doesn't it? So the Christian life isn't something that's hidden and just on a Sunday. Um, it does have a lot internally, doesn't it? But it works out. And last week we saw that it works out in, in verse 5 in regards to our sexual behaviour and desires. Um, in verse 7 uh, and 8 and 9, it, it works out in our speech. And then also... Um, in that latter part from verse 12, it works out in our relationships as well. So, the same Jesus that was mentioned in those first couple of chapters, the one who is preeminent, the one who is above all, the one who, um, in, in whom the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily, he wants to permeate every area of our life, doesn't he? And this section that we're going to look at this evening, we won't get to the end of the book, but we'll... Um, probably go to verse 6 of chapter 4. This section is going to show how our obedience and worship to Jesus as Lord um, affects our, our home life, our work life, for those of us that are working, and, and our private lives as well. And so um, as we go into that, the sort of home section, would somebody please read for us uh, Colossians 3 verses 18 to 21. <coughs> Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. Thanks, Chris. So, what Paul talks about now won't have direct application to everyone in all of these things. You know, we're of different ages, different marital statuses, married, single, divorced. Um, some of us are working, some of us are not working in paid employment. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Although from what I hear, retirement can be pretty, pretty taxing. Um, but we can draw things out of these, these um, principles that the Apostle gives, can't we? Um, maybe if we're not in a marriage, we can pray for those who are, or maybe our situation will change one day. Maybe we can pray for those who are do have young children. Um, but there are things we can all learn. And firstly, we come to this challenge in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. And, you know, these are unpopular. It's an unpopular injunction, isn't it? Uh, it's unpopular now, um, but also it was pretty countercultural then. And this, this sort of household that Paul's writing to um, was authoritarian. Um, the father or husband had rule over the life and death of his wife, of his children, of his slaves. And the kind of household that Paul is saying, this is fitting for a Christian, was very different, really. It's the way that power and um, authority was shown then. But he says, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. What does it mean to submit? Or what doesn't it mean to submit? Basically, obey, isn't it? 
It's not subjugation, is it? I think that's the problem. Mm -hmm. People misunderstand submit. You know, we submit to the Lord every day mm -hmm. in our lives mm -hmm. without any problems at all. And mm -hmm. he's made the husband the head of the house. So we submit. It is not a subjugation yeah. to submitting. It's, it's all, almost on a par with the next verse where it says about husbands loving your wives. Um, there's another passage which talks about as Christ loved the church. That's mm -hmm. what it's about. Yeah, yeah. It's loving each other as Christ loves us. Mm -hmm. yeah. You do. Is it choosing to put yourself under your authority? Or? Yeah. Mm. I think I think that's the point. It's it's it, it's voluntary. It's willing, isn't it? Mm. It's not you know. It's not a forced. <coughs> have some of that. Um, I think some people, um, men do make it that. That's yeah. the problem. Yeah. 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 And I think it is through history. You yeah. stopped at the end of verse 18, haven't you, for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of cultures would mm -hmm. still do that. Really use that. A lot of Christians somebody. would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Yeah, after, yeah, you say, yes, you must, uh, you must not stop on the first few words. But a lot of cultures do mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. They yeah. have to submit. They have no option. Oh, they take you are oh, sorry, you're taking that as a literal point then. Yeah. People take it literally. Yeah. The first few that first line. Mm. Yeah, Cass saying that people of other cultures do, but also sadly some Christians mm. neglect verse nineteen Says as well. The Bible. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, it's to willingly put yourself under the the direction, the, the authority and responsibility of another. And Submission is, it says, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. This is something that, that pleases God and that he sees as being appropriate. And I think we see in the Bible that submission is necessary for order in, in human society as a whole. So where else is one group told to submit to another? Or one type of person to another type of person, or role to another. Yeah, yeah. So Roman thirteen, we're told to submit to authorities. Any others? Same thing is said in First Peter about the authorities, and in First Peter five, verse five. Um, it says, likewise, you who are younger, subject, be subject to the elders. Now, that's either speaking in a kind of church setting, elders with a capital E, or younger to older and respect. Yeah. Children to parents, employees to employers. And this submission is, is necessary in the way that God has put us together. And at its heart, I think, it's about respect, isn't it? Um, have you heard of the love languages, the five love languages? It's a kind of a, a psychologist or psychiatrist's way of saying we all need different people. Oh, somebody can explain this better. Different people feel loved in different ways. It might be through physical touch, or it might be through words of affirmation, or it might be through I can't remember what they are. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> but I think. Yeah, yeah, deeds. Um, I can't remember. But I think that respect is the love language of husbands. Um, maybe it's a man being insecure, maybe it's his pride, I don't know. But the way in which marriage works on that side is, is for respect. We always talk to respect elders, I suppose. That's about the only word I've ever used when we were young, to respect elders. Now, I'm not a wife. I never plan to be a wife. Um, and <laughs> so there you go. Um, now, that would be an interesting one. It, it, would, it, it would. It <laughs> would. Coming up the AGM. Um, but, you know, some of you are wives, or have been. Um, yeah. Yeah. Georgia? Well, I couldn't respect my something to my husband because. Couldn't respect him because um, because of the way he treated mm -hmm. me through his, all the things he did. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. So, so it's a case of I had to finish it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose 
when we look at this, it's always good to look at the whole panoply of the Bible, isn't it? So the, the parallel passage to this section in Colossians is in Ephesians, and wives are told to submit, uh, as to the Lord. And, you know, if your husband tells you to do something that's directly contrary to Scripture, then you have to not submit to that in the same way that we shouldn't submit to government if it's in a contradiction. I think it, it, it all comes down, doesn't it, to, um, in a way, to the way that the husband treats the wife. If he's <coughs> living under God's rule himself, mm -hmm. he's submitted to God, mm -hmm. and therefore he lives rightly mm -hmm. under God, mm -hmm. yeah. then the wife doesn't have any problem submitting to him. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the that's idea. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I guess, even if a husband isn't what he ought to be, it still stands, doesn't it? But then the flip side, if the husband's wife is nagging at him all the time and he doesn't really want to love her, he's told to love her. And it says in um, First Peter again, I forget where it is, it might be chapter 2 or chapter 3. Um, First Peter chapter 3 verse 1. Likewise, wives be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives, when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Um, I think we're always to take the initiative, aren't we? But for a wife, part of her worship to Christ as Lord is submitting to her husband. And then verse 19 ladies she can breathe because it says husbands love your wives and do not be harsh with them isn't it interesting the way that that sentence is put together why do you think why do you think that husbands are told to love their wives surely that's self-explanatory if if yeah. it's your if it's your wife <coughs> oh it should be but it isn't always is it sadly Yeah, yeah, might be part of it. Yeah. But that doesn't stop you loving the person. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Yes, but, uh, you know. yes, I mean, in that culture then, it wasn't uh, demonstrative love, it was actually not really uh, part of their culture, was mm. it? You know, the wife was a, a goods and chattel, <laughs> almost. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Many people, and, you know, yeah. this would have been quite radical, really, yeah. for, mm. for lots of uh, husbands. And only really um, meaningful if you were a born again believer. Mm -hmm. You know, you couldn't, you wouldn't sort of say this to someone who was a pagan, because they'd just laugh at you. Yeah. yeah. Say that's ridiculous. Yeah. But for someone who's a, who put themselves under the authority of Christ by their submission to Him, it starts to mean things to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think. I just find it, I don't know whether it's grammatically correct, but it's just husband, love your wives. Is it an implication? It's a plural sign. Husbands. Yeah, I know. Wives submit to your husbands, tell your wife. Uh, yeah. stuff's going on. Well, you said husband, love your wife. Yeah. Well, yeah. You know, it's an injunction, isn't it? You're not, I think it's collective, isn't it? I think yeah. it is. Yeah. I think yeah. we can safely say that. Yeah. But multiple, multiple... Uh, Marriage partners yeah. was a common thing, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah well, I... Well, if generally you had one husband and lots of wives, didn't you? Yeah, and both the other way around. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily think it's yeah, interesting that. Yeah. And I guess that's something that was unique about this Christian yeah. gospel, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and I think it's true to say that in wherever the gospel has really made effect, wherever... The Christian church has flourished, also women have been given more freedom. Yeah. So if you go to Saudi Arabia, you know, you're only just able to drive. Mm, but if yeah. you go to somewhere perhaps in, in Europe, it's very different, isn't it? Husbands love your wives. It might not always come naturally. How does it how is it worded in Ephesians? Can you remember off the top of your heads? Uh, love you. as as yeah, as your own body, and as Christ loved the church and gave himself for yeah. her. Uh, Richard Chin, who wrote a book on Colossians, um, said that the shape of marriage for the husband is the shape of the cross. I thought it was quite profound. Um, Jesus 
loved the church by dying for her, didn't he? And so, you know, as me and G were deciding on what colour front door to have, and I was like, no, we shouldn't have that. I've actually been challenged looking back at that and thinking, if I can't even say, you know, dear, have the door in that colour of green, then, you know, I'm willing what, what, to do what more. What was wrong with the green? Um, just that I didn't like it. Nothing's wrong with it. <laughs> Nothing. Well, no, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. Um, G likes the colour, that sort of bluey green, which is quite popular. Can you picture it? Yeah. And to me, I think it seems a bit tacky. But there we go. I, I should have just said, do you know, dear, let's do it. You need, you, you, you need some wisdom from a friend of ours who's just gone to be with the Lord. Right. We go through his funeral next Friday. And he used to say to us, he says, the secret of a happy marriage is just three little words. Yes, my dear. Uh, <laughs> okay. How can a man love his wife? Now, I'm asking this personally, as somebody who's newly married, but also, you know, in what ways can a man love his wife? Husband, love his wife. Can I just give a, a little thing that I found very telling? Because it used to drive me mad um, because my daughter in law would lie. This is bed. recorded, Beth. Are you still happy to say it? Oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, somebody I knew <laughs> would, would insist on her husband waiting on her hand and foot mm -hmm. until one day I spoke to him and he said, That's what she liked him to do to show my love for her. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He certainly done that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's the other way around. You will see a lot of women waiting hand and foot on the line. Yeah. yeah. And it's not even kind of questioned about. Mm -hmm. And so that's different. That's true. I'm, I'm restraining myself now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm being good. No. Um, I, yeah. I was always well prepared to do, do for my husband um, more because he went out and worked. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so you you should get the meal ready and, and all that sort of thing. You show your love that way. He showed mm. his love at that particular time by earning the money to so that I could, could mm -hmm. go out and buy food and that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, kind of working in partnership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. what I was going to do. It does work different when one's working and one isn't. Yeah. But like now, you just said the right word. Uh, I, I am not allowed to clean. Well, I do clean up after I finish, but I like, I do the cooking, etc. Diane does all the tidying and cleaning and washing. Mm. So we do a 50 50. Mm -hmm. oh, I do clean up if, after. You know what? I'm if you're done. upset about not having anywhere to clean, you're welcome to come and clean my ass. But <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to marry The problems of being single, you just have got to do it all. Yeah. <laughs> or you're not do it. They're the options. Yeah. Well, the one suggestion yeah, of. <laughs> The one suggestion of how a husband is to love his wife, I think comes up in that same verse. Don't be harsh. Oh, yeah. Don't be bitter, don't be irritable. Now that can be physically, can't it? And mm -hmm. obvious, obviously that's wrong, but also in words and in attitudes. And expectations are up here. Don't be harsh. And that's the acid test that Paul gives here in the Colossians for, is your husband loving you well? Is he harsh with you? And whilst I was reading about this, a question came up um, of application to husbands, so you two and me. Um, is your wife afraid of you when you're angry? This shouldn't be the case. I thought that was a good, a good question. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm a harsh. So loving his wife is part of the husband's worship to Christ as Lord. He gives her love, she gives him respect, and then it's a partnership. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, this seems more comfortable territory, but also has its implications too. Um, okay, obey. What does it mean? Do what they tell me to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that is what it means. So the word is used of one who... On the knock at the door, comes to listen to who it is. He's ready as a duty, as a porter. Um, I guess you think about um, 
Samuel, is it Samuel in the temple? Mm -hmm. And he's, he's listening, he's ready, he's ready to obey. And I've heard it said that there are only four verses in the entire Bible that are directly spoken to children, mm -hmm. directly addressed to children. And they pretty much all say this. And so for the Christian child, a big part of his or her worship to Jesus as Lord is, is obeying mum and dad. Now, it has its limits, doesn't it? Um, obviously, just as, um, you know, respect and submission, and as a social worker, you've seen all the horrible ends of that cat. Mm. But this is the, the go-to thing, you know? Part of my worship to Jesus is I'm going to listen and do what mum and dad say. And we trust in that partnership that mum and dad are going to give good instructions. So some of you are seasoned parents, and I'm not. So how can I, as a dad, um, help my children, encourage them to obey? How can I make that easy? Be kind to them in every way. So much for what, uh, just keep being kind to them, and uh, they'll respect you for that. Have you found that to be true, parents? Or? To not always work like that. Or? It's a very challenging mm -hmm. yeah. not, not I know when, like, when you're young kids, you know, mm -hmm. you've got that bit of what she did. Like. I think you hope you set them, set them an example of someone who cares for, you know, like a care for your wife, mm -hmm. care for other people, and show respect to other people, <coughs> and set them that example. Um, so it's not. You know, when you say children obey your parents, yes, you, you know, you, sometimes you have to be more instructive and say, you know, you've got to do that. You know, but most of the time, I think the, you know, the, the better message is when you set them that example, so that they follow your example. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, that verse in, in Ephesians, where it says about not provoking your children to anger, it says, bring them up in the discipline, so that's the... And instruction of the Lord. So, yeah. You know, you've got both sides, haven't you? You're instructing them, but sometimes you have to discipline them. Mm -hmm. As the Lord does with us. Mm -hmm. He instructs us, but He has to discipline us. It's mm -hmm. not always nice. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, verse, verse 21 gives the sort of application fathers, and He doesn't talk to mothers, which makes me think that perhaps this is more of a father's problem. Fathers, do not provoke your children. I say become discouraged. Um, is there any general things that as a social worker you can speak into this kind of things that you've learned? Things that Well, I was thinking about the, the, the we talk a lot as well, especially in the kind of adoption side, is about regulation. So kind of the responsibility of a parent is to help a child to regulate, to manage their emotions, to deal with the situation. And one of the big things is that the adult in the situation needs to take the time to regulate themselves. Mm. So that they can't be any use to a child if they're not in the right place. So trying to make a reasoned decision, taking a breath, that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the idea of, yeah, being in the situation and making a yeah. wise choice as best you can, uh, rather than a kind of knee-jerk reaction, mm -hmm. which is, yeah, which is not good. Uh, yeah, yeah abso abso absolutely. But well, there is a consciousness to that, isn't there? That the, the idea is that that's the decision you make almost before you're angry. That you're gonna do this and, and you'll cock it up spectacularly but it's um yeah and, and just another thing we've talked about is when you get it wrong being willing to apologize and repair relationships yeah. and say you know what i did do that wrong i shouldn't have and that, that is a really good a way of repairing relationships but also a way of showing that you know, how you make mistakes and how you deal with them so it's just be careful when it money I've seen some kids at a very young age provoke parents physically when they've been outside. It's when they, when they provoke the parents that just, that's when the parent has got to pull himself and not lose the, well, the, the anger reality factor. Is, if you lose the anger factor, you've had it. The reality is, it's a difficult one, but children are made to provoke parents. That is why they cry. Because there is, <laughs> there is a model called serve and return. This is a random fact. But um, the idea is that when a baby cries, it's because something's going wrong in their body, and yeah. so their cortisol is raising and they're not coping. And so they cry to get soothed. Yeah. And so their crying makes their carers 
cortisol go off and get stressed and everything like that. So the best way to serve the, serve the baby is by soothing them, which means their cortisol goes down, which means they stop crying, which means the parents' cortisol reduces. Yeah, yeah, um, so actually, children are made to be annoying. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? That is what they do. That is yeah, how they have their that. needs. Yeah. Yeah. Because I've... We've often found that the sort of naughtiness is often a cry for attention. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, if, if you look at children who've experienced trauma and need to be parented in a therapeutic manner, you, you talk about the idea of um, attention seeking is attachment seeking. Yeah. It's a child needing something. Mm. Yeah. Whereas we as a society have gone down the route of the social behavioural model, which is where if someone is seeking attention, we ignore them. Because that's, anyway, sorry, you don't need me to get on my high horse about this. But yeah, it is a different way of thinking about things. Yeah. But, um, <coughs> but yeah. I suppose well, coming back to it, sorry, go ahead. Well, the Lord said the child had its way, did not it? So, no matter what age it is, you know. So they're going to be A child does have, have its ways. No matter what age it is, it will have its ways. But you've got to control that. Yeah, 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 and we discipline. and yeah. It's walking the line down the middle, yeah. isn't it? Too much is, too, too much is bad and too little is bad. Yeah. Yeah. I think the it's a hard line. We've found it. Not all children, but like I say, most of them. It's the importance of, you know. of, of setting boundaries. Mm. You know, because, you know, I seem to remember. I can't remember who it was, but one of the um, we listened to a Christian speaker once, and he was saying about you know how um, fences are important. Mm -hmm. They give the child reassurance mm -hmm. that somebody actually cares. Mm -hmm. You know, they push against it yeah. to see whether it's there. Mm -hmm. You know, they're not trying to necessarily push it flat, but they, you know, it's yeah. part of that reassurance. Yeah, mum well, and dad do care parents. that I'm I'm going to be out until midnight. I need to be in by 11 or whatever. <laughs> yeah. So, the instruction is fathers, do not provoke your children. Don't be too harsh, too demanding, controlling, unforgiving. Part of your worship, if you're a father with a child, is um, worship to Christ as Lord, being fair to children. Isn't it? And then we move on to this section, which talks about, in verse 22, bond servants. Um, which brings us into a bit of a, a topic about slavery. Mm. It, so, the Bible doesn't condemn slavery as a whole, and some people find that difficult. You know, some people say, well, Jesus never condemned slavery or whatever. But, but neither does it endorse it. And the Bible tells the story of what actually happened, didn't it? It tells history of this is what happened, this race did this, this, you know, this um, person killed such and such. It's recording history. However, the Bible does condemn the abuse of slavery and it condemns the abuse of slaves. And even in the Old Testament where there are kind of rules around keeping slaves, mm. there are rules about it. Um, in First Timothy 1.10, there's real condemnation about those who, um, I'll look it up because I'll get the words wrong, um, but what we would think of in the kind of transatlantic slave trade as was, from here to Africa to America, um, those who are enslavers, um, the law is laid down for such ungodly sinners, those who are enslavers, and that, that's people who, who steal people in order to sell them into slavery. So the Bible does condemn the abuse of it. And in the Bible, there are different sorts of slaves, aren't there? There are those who, you know, might have been prisoners of war, and then you're either be killed or you become a slave, and the choice to many seemed quite obvious. Uh, there were people like Joseph, remember he was, wasn't he? He was, he was a slave or a servant in part of his house, but he was given responsibility over the running of the entire business, wasn't he? And here, we, we address, uh, it's addressed to bond servants. So in the bond, a bond servant in the Roman Empire was somebody who was officially bound under contract to serve his or her master for seven years. And then when the contract expired, the person was freed and given the wage that had been saved by the master and then officially declared a freed man. Um, and if you're interested in this, if you're reading the ESV, there might be a little footnote where it, where it says about bond servants. And in the preface to the ESV, it says how it's translated the word. But, so, 
So when they got released and got paid, was that the money that they got there or was that the back pay? I think that's the back pay, yeah. I guess they're set up then to be a free person. Whether that worked out all the time, I'm not sure, but that's apparently what a bond service was. That's after six years, isn't it? Um, in the Old Testament, there's that thing about Jubilee, isn't there? But I think in, in the Roman Empire, it was seven years. Um, yeah. Um, but the fact that Paul writes here to bond servants makes you think they're in the church, weren't they? They're apparently free to come and gather with the church and hear this letter that's been read out. And this is what he says to him, bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Now, we're going to take this and apply it into a kind of work setting. Um, it m more directly applies to somebody who's maybe a servant in a house because that doesn't exist very commonly, <laughs> although it does in some places, doesn't it? You might have a domestic servant. We'll apply it in regards to work. And we have that same instruction there, obey, don't we? Those who are your earthly masters. Um, how might this apply then in a working situation to your line manager? Actually, do your work when you're working from home, not sit watching TV. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. I mean, it, it must be happening more. Yeah, it's true. The rise of working from home. And even when you try and multitask, like you feel that you're being efficient, but you're not, are you? Well, I'm not. Speak for yourself. Okay. <laughs> Go on, something, don't ask a busy person. Um, yeah. What what eye service? It says, don't do eye service. What's that? So is it looking after someone's just spectacles? Working, just, just working when you're under the eye. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. If the boss's back's turned, you are back to talking. Yeah. <laughs> but the challenge is that you are always under your boss's eye because your real master is Christ. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. what Paul says. Do it with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord, knowing that whatever you do, you're doing it for the Lord and not for men. So if being under the boss's eye makes you more diligent, or on the other hand, if his back's turned makes you more sluggish, then remember that. We, we can and we should always be diligent because our real master, who's above the CEO or the head of the council or whoever it might be, is, is, is watching. Yeah, I've been told, perhaps, not, well, in a serious way, but say, look, if you're having a rough day, remember, you're not working for him, you are actually working for the Lord. Yeah. It makes your life a little bit easier. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Have, have, have we got time for me to just say this as well? Yeah. Um, our brother-in-law did his some medical elective in Africa, and he worked with two doctors there. And from a Christian point of view, a lot of people would have said that one one of the doctors was very um, spiritual, right? But he, not being a Christian, saw a totally different side of things because the, one of the men that he was working under just was working, he, was, he could have been a top surgeon in this country if he was out on the mission field. He was just working, he was just doing everything he could for people, just working all the hours, really sacrificially working. If you like. And the other one that some Christians would have said was more spiritual was out ministering to people, mm. having cups of coffee and doing this, that and the other and so on. And our brother-in-law said that surgeon was much more of a Christian, as he saw it, mm. than the other fella. Because he was actually doing what he was there to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And that, that really spoke to him. Yeah. You know, so I thought that was very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Now, the majority here are retired, but we still take application from this. You might not have applications to a boss anymore. You might have to sign a timesheet or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but you do have obligations to the landlord, maybe, if you live in a rented house, or, or the council, so speaking about your council bill, mm -hmm. or, you know, 
Chris and I, trustees of the Charity Commission, you know, we have these authorities that we could be tempted to be like, oh, well, whatever. But why don't we work or fulfill our obligations as if we're doing it to the Lord? When I'm typing in CCLI, which is the licensing company, how many times we use the song, bless the Lord, O my soul, in the past six months, you know, well, may I do it to the Lord? Do you actually uh, keep a tally of that? We have to, yeah. You have really? to say how many times you display mm -hmm. or sing a song. Do you have to say it more if you repeated it 57 times? Yeah. Really? Really, I should Some do it every week, I find really out. struggle. Yeah. Oh no, not if you no, not if you no, repeat no, it like on the screen it, it once. I was gonna <laughs> but, say if you use it you repeated week. this fifty seven times. <laughs> a, lot, a, lot, a lot of the church presentation software do it automatically. Mm. Counters. Uh, oh that makes yeah. sense. So, that that makes it can be made a lot Some will tally bless the Lord of my soul. <laughs> Before you started using that, of course it was all long time. I have yeah. to do it because it's a merchant. Wow. Yeah. That was a big job. But Obe for a employee, obedience to his boss is part of his worship to Christ as the Lord. And what I think we probably won't go into chapter four actually, so we don't run on too late. But um, what I like as we go into verse twenty three and twenty four, uh, in fact, would somebody read verse twenty three and twenty four for us, please? Whatever you do, work heartily as as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> Work heartily. Where in the Bible timeline, you know, if you think about Genesis 1 to Revelation 22, where in the Bible timeline did work begin? Right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. Yeah. Right at yeah. the beginning. Yeah. And it was in the garden, not it? Exactly, yeah. And that was before the fall, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And so we take from that then that work is good. Work which is fruitless or um, you know, just absolute grind is a result of the fall because God said to Adam, by the sweat of your brow you'll you know, grow the grow the plants and there'll be thorns and thistles. But work itself is is, is good. And never a punishment in the first place. No, no. And a lot of people during lockdown found, you know, their mental health was affected because they couldn't, as in their eyes, do anything productive. Yeah. They were just sat twiddling the thumbs. Yeah. To be fair, people's mental health was affected without working too. <laughs> well, that's true, that's true. But what these verses do is bring dignity to paid work, to unpaid work. They bring dignity to every area of, of a Christian's life because whatever he does, no matter how rubbish it is or lame or maybe he's at home most of the time because he doesn't have many friends or whatever, whatever he does or she does, she can do it heartily as for the Lord and not for men. Yeah. Everything can be worship. There's no sacred and secular divide, as people say. So, you know, when, when you go home and you take the bins out, can be worshipped to the Lord. You can take others' bins out. You can take the bins out with joy in your heart. <laughs> saying, thank you, Lord, that I've got a rubbish man to come and collect I'll this rubbish. I'll bring him in. If he takes him out, I'll bring him in. There you go. Bring him in with a whistle. <laughs> it must be empty. <laughs> um, one of my favourite characters in the Bible is Hezekiah, and I want to show you this in his life. So in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, um, just a little snapshot um, that's said about Hezekiah. He was one of the godly kings of Judah. Second Chronicles 31. 31. 31. 2 Chronicles 31. In verse 20, what's just been said is that Hezekiah has organised all the priests. Um, and in verse 20 it says, Thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah, and he did what was good and right and faithful before the Lord his God. And every work that he undertook in the service of the house of God, and in accordance with the law and the commandments, seeking his God, he did with all his heart, and he prospered. And would that be us? Be it some kind of thing we do in church on a rotor, 
which just seems to go on and on. <clears throat> the Brooks, thank you so much for it. But, you know, that can be part of our worship to the Lord, can't it? Um, a while ago, on a Sunday morning, um, I had this phrase that came to mind, which is, bless the Lord, oh my purse, or oh my wallet. I don't know if you remember me saying that. But we can put anything in there, can't we? Bless the Lord, oh my wallet. Bless the Lord, oh my work. Bless the Lord, oh my administration, as I'm looking after the paperwork to run the house. Bless the Lord, oh my punctuality, oh my keeping of agreements. And for the wife, she can say, bless the Lord, oh my submission to my husband. For a husband, he can say, bless the Lord, the way that I'm loving my wife. Yeah. And you get the point. Mm -hmm. You know, all these things are to be shaped by honouring Christ as Lord. Everything in the Christian's life can have dignity and purpose because it's all done to Jesus as the master. No matter how boring your life might seem or stressful or whatever, it can be done as worship. And then the kind of reasoning is given in verse 25 sorry, and verse 24, there is, there is a reward to come. At work, you might not be rewarded. In the street, when you take the bins out, you might not be recognised. <laughs> but there is an inheritance, and that's the life to come. And the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Maybe that person... strange verse, that, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Why'd you say it, Chris? Well, it just seems, it just a kind of, yeah. Seems it's jarring, do you think? Negative, where yes. all the other things are being positive. Uh -huh. things, you know, and uh, who is he referring to as the wrongdoer here? Mm -hmm. And is it a person who doesn't follow that the teaching there? And, well, and, and what's the partiality got to do with it? Any thoughts on that? Does it suffer a little bit from where we've played to the end of the chapter? Yes, I think it does. <laughs> it kind of might do. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the, the paragraph finishes at uh, well, 4 verse 1, really. They do it, it in the Psalms all the time, don't they? They get overexcited and they end up going, and kill that one! Yes. Ah! <laughs> and then they go back and they're like, oh yeah, then God's great. Uh, it <laughs> seems to be that there's quite a lot of Bible people just kind of thinking things through. Yeah. Paul does it quite a few times where he goes, oh, I'll come back to that later. I think it seems to be in that same section, verse 22, where he's still addressing bond servants, isn't he? And he's talking about the reward in verse 24. You know, maybe you're slogging away in such and such his house and you're looking after the kids and thinking about a bond servant now and you're making all the food and you're looking after the farm and whatever. Well, there's a reward to come. But on the flip side, if you're not working heartily to the Lord, know this, the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he's done and there's no partiality. There's, there's a there's a levelling out, isn't there? Is there is it the kind of flip side of it as well? If you know what I mean, if you're thinking about, you know, in the Psalms when they say, Why do the wicked prosper? Mm -hmm. In theory you'll be looking in a house and there'll be someone who is dossing about mm -hmm. who seems to be doing well. And the kind of thing they'll Doesn't get what's coming out. to them, you look after you, kind of thing. I think so, yeah. The good person who works hard might not get rewarded. On the flip side, the dosser might get a promotion, but mm -hmm. <laughs> in the age to come yes exactly and that's only the case with God the best boss might, might miss the mark and then yeah verse 1 does actually tie this paragraph he's talked about employees if you like but now he talks about employers masters treat your bond servants justly and fairly knowing that you also have a master in heaven and just to kind of apply this maybe at work you might have people who are subordinate to you, then be fair to those people as to the Lord. Students. <laughs> Your students, be kind to them. There we are. So any thoughts then as we wrap it up, and we won't go into the rest of chapter four tonight. Any applications? Some of us, the application will be, let's pray for that family, or that, 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 that child, parent, wife, husband. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've been so efficient. <laughs> what can we say? All right. But yeah, every area of life can be transformed by Jesus, Lord. He's the master. You can do it to him. 
Amen.